the question that has perplexed philosophers for millennia, from Socrates to Nietzsche to Thoreau, none of them can reach a consensus to the question, is Half-Life Opposing Force canon to the Half-Life series? Today, I will tackle that debate. What is canon? Wikipedia says, Canon is the material accepted as officially part of the story in the fictional universe of that story. Pretty self-explanatory. I'll make no pretenses about it. I think it is canon. Great. That's out of the way. Now, to back up a bit for anyone who is not familiar with this infamous discussion, infamous heated discussion, I'm going to assume you've played the Half-Life games, but if you haven't, and you're fine with spoilers, then it should be easy enough to follow along. Speaking of spoilers, there will be major story spoilers for Half-Life 1, Half-Life Opposing Force, and Half-Life Blue Shift, as well as very minor spoilers for Half-Life 2. I will also include a section about Half-Life Alex, the most recent game in the series, with major story spoilers, but I will clearly mark that part when I get to it. Half-Life Opposing Force was the first expansion pack made for Half-Life. Half-Life was developed by Valve Software, while Opposing Force was officially developed by Valve and Gearbox Software, although the reality is that Valve commissioned Gearbox to develop it by themselves, with only a little guidance from Valve. The story of Opposing Force takes players back to the exact same events of Half-Life, but from the perspective of a different character. And this is where the controversy arises. Opposing Force introduces many enemies and plot points that were not present in Half-Life, such as a new alien race known as Race X invading Earth during the Black Mesa incident, and the Black Ops seen in the original game being assigned to kill the Marines for failing their own mission to contain the facility and silence witnesses. Additionally, all subsequent Half-Life games, which were developed solely by Valve Software, have had no references to any of the enemies unique to Opposing Force. So let's get into the evidence. As I said before, I lean on the side that Opposing Force is indeed canon to the series. One of the main reasons I take that stance is that I honestly really like what it brings to the table. Race X's involvement in the Black Mesa incident, and the notion that military forces were being turned on each other, adds a lot of depth and intrigue to Half-Life's plot. I mean, a cover-up to cover up the cover-up is just, well some may say contrived, but I say creative. The introduction of Race X also implies that there are many different and unconnected alien races in the Half-Life universe, and that the ones seen in the original Half-Life aren't the only ones that exist, nor are they the only supposedly important ones. To me, that makes the game's universe significantly more interesting, but there's plenty of more objective evidence to support Opposing Force's canonicity. For instance, the developers went to great lengths to line up its plot with the plot of the original game. Interweaving events are correctly paced, mainly the radio broadcast about the tactical map and Gordon Freeman going through the portal to Zen, which occur about two chapters apart in both games. I'm in, Cooper. Do you copy? Forget about Freeman. We're abandoning the base. If you have any last bomb targets, mark them on the tactical map. Otherwise, get the hell out of there. Repeat, we are pulling out and commencing airstrikes. Give us targets or get below. It's ready. You must go, now. Race X also only begins to appear around the time Gordon Freeman is leaving Earth. They don't come out in full force until after you actually see him go through the portal to Zen, which doesn't house any members of Race X as far as we know. There's a lot of unfounded complaints people have about Race X, which is that they don't make any sense of being an opposing force because they weren't seen in the original game. However, the appearance of these new aliens completely correlates with the original game. Lining up the timelines of the two games, the first appearance of Race X is a lone shock trooper teleporting to Earth and away again after a few seconds, which takes place roughly around the time of surface tension in Half-Life, toward the end of the Earthbound section of the game. In their first appearances early in Opposing Force, it's apparent Race X is only teleporting to Earth in small isolated groups of their weaker forces, which Gordon Freeman never had much of a chance to see in the original game. They don't even appear after that chapter until after you witness Gordon Freeman leave Earth. Then there's the stance of Mark Laidlaw, the lead writer for the first two Half-Life games, as well as the Half-Life 2 episodes, who frankly doesn't believe in the issue of canonicity, saying that it's something that fans came up with. When asked about canon, he said, We don't get involved in issues of canonicity. You might say the canon itself is non-canon. So no official stance, there's just the games. This makes the conversation even muddier than it already was, since the lead writer had no belief in a canon for the Half-Life universe. However, he also said in an interview from before Half-Life 2 released, 
We had a lot of conversations with Gearbox concerning the creation of Opposing Force and Blue Shift, and I supplied them with various documents that fleshed out background elements that hadn't been woven directly into the foreground of Half-Life. He specifically points out Barney's Odyssey to Zen, where a bit more light is shed on the Zen Relay Teleport experiments, but I'll get to Blue Shift soon enough. He then says, We merely tried to make sure they dovetailed with our own designs, and didn't create any huge conflicts. Laidlaw, while not directly working on Opposing Force, confirms here that he did contribute to the project and its story to make sure it lined up with the original game, and if the expansions were never meant to be canon, why would they bother? But he goes on to say that Gearbox, as fans of the original, had a good eye for places where their stories could overlap with Half-Life, but even so, they took plenty of liberties with the story for the sake of making a fun game. Fun in a game is ultimately more important than consistency. Reaffirming that the story and lore is not the main focus of these games, the games themselves are more important. But it's still fun to squabble. Of course, Mark Laidlaw isn't the lead writer of Half-Life anymore, and didn't even work on Half-Life Alex, so things may have changed since then, but I'll also get back to that later. For now, allow me to address some common concerns regarding Opposing Force's canonicity status. Another, more specific criticism is the existence of the Gnome in Opposing Force. The Gnome is likely, although never explicitly stated to be, the advanced stage of a headcrab zombie after the headcrab has been attached for many hours. This is why they only appear in Opposing Force, as that game takes place a couple days after the start of the alien invasion, and headcrabs have been running around in Black Mesa for a few days at that point. Gordon Freeman doesn't encounter any headcrab zombies in the last couple chapters of the Earthbound section of Half-Life, so obviously he wouldn't see any Gnomes either. Now the question people ask is, why don't the Gnomes show up in Half-Life 2, considering there are headcrabs living on their hosts for way longer than a few days, especially in, say, Ravenholm? There are a few simple conclusions to draw here. The most obvious being that in Half-Life 2, the headcrabs are genetically modified, hence them being used as biological weapons by the Combine for mortar strikes. The Combine probably don't want extra dangerous mutated zombies running around, costing them more resources if they can avoid it with genetic modification. The fact that the Gnomes mutate so rapidly may also imply that they have short lifespans, and that the zombies seen in Half-Life 2 are the ones that did not go to this further stage, and thus lasted longer. The ambiguity of a lot of the lore in Half-Life lends itself well to having various reasonable explanations. The writers never wrote themselves into a corner because they laid out detailed origin stories for the headcrabs, only to contradict themselves a few games down the line. The issue with the Gnome leads into a bigger issue people have with Opposing Force, particularly the one-off nature of lots of elements in the game. A big reason that some people consider Opposing Force to be non-canon is due to the fact that supposedly nothing from Opposing Force shows up or is mentioned again in Half-Life 2 or subsequent installments such as the nuking of Black Mesa, Race X, or the protagonist Adrian Shepard. However, there are explanations for all of these things. Referencing the series' former head writer Mark Laidlaw again, there is pressure on us to set Half-Life 2 at Black Mesa, which a lot of us felt would be creative death. It was important to break new ground. Nuking Black Mesa was a good way to ensure that we had a way to avoid setting Half-Life 2 there. The destruction of the Black Mesa research facility via Nuke was not solely a Gearbox idea, but one of the few story beats suggested to them by Laidlaw. Although it's not specifically mentioned in Half-Life 2 and the episodes, it's implied that Black Mesa is destroyed by the fact that no characters make any efforts to return there. On the topic of Race X, Laidlaw has stuck to his statement about canonicity being made up by fans, and has said, Race X was purely a Gearbox creation that doesn't figure at all into my thinking about the world. Which again, doesn't rule them out, especially now that different writers are in charge of Half-Life, and might have a different way of thinking about the Half-Life universe. Like I said earlier, Race X can simply make the Half-Life universe feel more expansive. They don't need to show up again if their purpose has been served, and it seems to have been. Randy Pitchford, setting aside all the things he has done in recent years, who is and was the head of Gearbox, has said that he worked within a framework articulated to him by Mark Laidlaw of Valve, that allowed for many alien species to exist in the universe, showing that Valve were on board with there being aliens in the Half-Life universe separate from the ones seen in the original game. As for Adrian Shepard, Laidlaw has stated, Adrian Shepard is a bit like Schrodinger's cat. He's neither canon nor non-canon, depending on whether or not the G-Man may or may not have a use for him. And based on the ending of Opposing Force, there's no need for Adrian Shepard to return in Half-Life 2 or any subsequent games anyway, because the G-Man is keeping him detained, isolated from everyone and everything. Around the release of Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Gabe Newell, CEO of Valve, said that he was sure that they would get back to Adrian Shepard one of these days. Doug Lombardi, Valve's VP of Marketing, 
also said at the time that while there was no Adrian Shepard project in development, that's not to say we won't ever come back and tell another Shepard story. All of this implies that Valve wants to keep the door open for Adrian Shepard's character, even if they never end up using him in the future. I would also like to point out that most of my arguments here also apply to Half-Life Blue Shift and Half-Life Decay, the two other Half-Life expansions that were developed by Gearbox and overseen by Valve. The difference, however, is that those two games essentially only use concepts that were presented in the original Half-Life, so no race acts or anything like that are present, but it makes sense in those games' timelines. However, the protagonist in Blue Shift is a security guard named B. Calhoun, with the first name presumed to be Barney, which is the same name as a former security guard in Half-Life 2. Some people believe these two to be the same character, some don't. Mark Laidlaw has said that it doesn't particularly bother him to think maybe it was the story of how the Barney in Half-Life 2 escaped Black Mesa. However, he also said that the Gearbox expansions don't figure in any of his thinking about the game, except in a very general way i.e. some of the science team survived. So once again, Laidlaw deliberately avoids the issue, stating honestly that they don't affect his own writing, while still respecting their existence. And I respect that. Now here is the section about Half-Life Alex, the most recent game in the series, and the first one in over a decade, and how it addresses or doesn't address Opposing Force and the other expansions, as well as Valve's current stance on the issue now that Mark Laidlaw is no longer at Valve. There will be significant spoilers for Half-Life Alex, so if you would like to avoid spoilers, skip to 1448. Okay? Good. So this first thing might seem super insignificant, but trust me, it's important. Throughout Half-Life Alex, you can find these floppy disks that say 50 free games and list a whole bunch of fictional games, including one called Prax Wars 2 Dante's Revenge. This is a reference to this arcade game, briefly seen during the opening tram ride of Half-Life Blue Shift. You might be thinking that this is just a simple easter egg, especially considering most people can't even read text this small on current VR headsets, but you have to consider that this is the first time any Half-Life game has directly referenced anything specific to Half-Life Blue Shift. The second thing is a bit more general, but definitely supports Opposing Force's story being canon, much more so than any other game in the series has. At the end of Half-Life Alex, the G-Man places Alex into stasis in the same way he placed Gordon Freeman into stasis at the end of Half-Life. In the past, I've seen some criticism about the G-Man and Opposing Force, saying he acts out of character by aiding Adrian Shepard throughout the game and then putting him in stasis at the end, when in later games, there is nothing to suggest the G-Man ever abducted anyone besides Gordon Freeman. Well, in the newest game, the G-Man does just that. Supporting the idea that Gordon Freeman is not necessarily so special that the G-Man would only ever take him. Not to mention Adrian Shepard is specifically detained in Opposing Force, as opposed to both Gordon and Alex who are hired. Going back to the argument that Race X is non-canon because they are never mentioned again after Opposing Force, Half-Life Alex includes a new alien enemy that is referred to as a lightning dog. Half-Life Alex is a prequel, and yet this enemy never showed up in Half-Life 2 or the episodes, yet there's no reason to believe this enemy isn't canon. The character of Russell exists in a similar vein, as he is never mentioned in chronologically later games either. In Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Dr. Magnuson shows up after having never been mentioned before, and he isn't mentioned in this game either, yet he is certainly canon. Not everything needs to be constantly brought up again or continue reappearing to qualify as canon, and Half-Life Alex only reaffirms that. Now let's talk about the current stance of Valve on the issue of canonicity. With Mark Laidlaw retired from Valve, since before development on Half-Life Alex began, the writers for the game were Eric Wolpaw, who was a co-writer on the Half-Life 2 episodes, as well as a writer for Portal 1 and Portal 2, Jay Pinkerton, who also wrote Portal 2, and Sean Vanneman, who wrote Campo Santo's Firewatch and came to work at Valve when they acquired Campo Santo in 2018. Only one of these writers had any involvement in the Half-Life series, and not even previously on a main title, so this is essentially a fresh team of writers. And considering the ending of Half-Life Alex, this team definitely wants to take the story in a different direction. However, as far as I know, none of these writers nor any other developer on Half-Life Alex has talked about the Gearbox expansions in any of the press interviews for the game. I also read through the entirety of Jeff Keighley's The Final Hours of Half-Life Alex, and once again, no mention of them. There's no reason to believe Valve's stance on Half-Life canon has changed from canon itself being non-canon, but with a small reference to Half-Life Blue Shift in this newest game, I don't think it's outlandish to believe Valve is not shutting out the Gearbox expansions entirely. Alright, spoiler talk over. I think my main point boils down to, why not? The arguments against it are flimsy at best. 
but as Valve and Mark Laidlaw have never been firmly against or in support of the stories of the Gearbox expansions in the present day, it makes the topic very grey. Even the original Half-Life could be considered non-canon with how much retconning has been shoved into it with even just Half-Life 2 in the episodes, not to mention how many of its enemies never returned in Half-Life 2, like the alien grunts, although it's obviously an absurd claim to say the first game is not canon. For the record, I'm not a die-hard Opposing Force fanboy. I know there's a group of Half-Life fans who feel that Opposing Force is better than the original game, or even the best game in the series. Honestly, I think it's one of the weakest Half-Life games, and while that's still a very high standard, it has quite a few flaws. But that's not the focus of this video. I do think that one of Opposing Force's strengths is in adding a lot of interesting concepts and depth to the Half-Life universe that you really miss out on if you dismiss the entire game. Regardless, just remember, Fun in a game is ultimately more important than consistency. I hope you enjoyed my hot takes and the video, and maybe even gained a newfound appreciation for Opposing Force. If you have any criticisms, compliments, or suggestions, post a comment. I'd love to hear them. Thank you for watching.